Welcome back to the Narrative Monopoly podcast. On today's episode, we have someone who led the charge to get the CIA to release the files captured from bin Laden's compound. That guy is Tom Jocelyn. Tom knows everything about the world of jihad. He has studied it for 20 years, and he gives us insights into the questions that you're probably wondering in the back of your mind, which is what's going on with Al-Qaeda? What's going on with the Taliban now that we're pulling out of Afghanistan? What happened to ISIS? And all of those relevant questions, um, and we even talk about a lot of the specific characters in Al-Qaeda and in that world. So this is one that you are not going to want to miss. Um, Great primer on these subjects. So without further ado, let's press play. On today's podcast, we have Tom Jocelyn. Tom is a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and is an editor at FDD's Long War Journal, a widely read publication on counterterrorism and related issues. His main focus is on jihadism and how Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State operate around the globe. He has served as a consultant for FBI's counterterrorism division and has testified before Congress more than 20 times. He has constructed dossiers on hundreds of terrorists during the course of his work. He's been described as one of the most trusted authorities on Al-Qaeda network, on the Al-Qaeda network, because his because of his encyclopedia knowledge on terrorist biographies. And in 2017, as a result of his efforts, the CIA declassified and released the vast majority of the files captured in Osama bin Laden's compound. How did you get those files released and, and how are you doing tom well jeff thanks for having me um how did i get those files released that's a whole other podcast i would say <laughs> to answer that question it was basically just constantly being the drum on the hill and in washington for the files and i think it's um probably for your listeners it's probably better to back up for a second and talk sure. about why i would get those files released or why i i agitated for the files to be put out there um it's one of the strangest things in all this that I've been working on for so many years now is that there's still to this day is not a commonly accepted definition of Al Qaeda as an organization, a terrorist organization, and then associated groups. There's no um, commonly accepted definition or hierarchy, or uh, if you think about it, you know, a wire mapping of how this actual organization exists to this day. And that's very strange. Um, you know, America spent hundreds of billions, perhaps more, on this, what was formerly known as the War on Terror following, following 9-11. And yet, I find to this, you know, this many years later that um, if you go across the U.S. intelligence community or you go across the expert community, there's really no consensus on what this organization is or looks like um, as of 2021. In fact, there are some commonly held paradigms for it that are obviously flawed. They're obviously, we can talk about that. They're obviously wrong, but um, there's no, nobody can sit down and tell you, you know, here's what the entire sort of management structure of Al Qaeda looks like. And how does the the Al Qaeda senior leadership interact with groups around the world? None of those basic questions are really being answered on a, on a regular basis. And that's very strange. And the Bin Laden files to me were one of the best primary source primary uh, caches of primary source documents that could be used to sort of set a baseline for Al Qaeda to understand what the organization is. Um, If you go back through what the CIA and others were talking about at the time, prior to the Bin Laden raid in May of 2011, um, there was this commonly, it was widely believed, commonly believed that Bin Laden was basically this spiritual figurehead who was out of the day-to-day management of Al Qaeda's global operations and lo and behold, the CIA starts digging into these files and they find that the exact opposite is true. That in fact, he was not only managing this network, but he was in many cases micromanaging it. And there's a whole story there about how that assessment was changed behind closed doors. And yet it didn't really affect much of the public discourse at all. And so part of the reason why we, we or I agitated to get the files released was to show people what was in them and explain to people, give them a more accurate, in my mind, sense of how this all works. 
So before we dive into the source material, what was in there from a kind of tactical perspective, I would wonder, you know, why would they even release them to the public? You know, because my thought is, okay, well, doesn't the CIA have analysts and and don't they have the ability or, or the kind of the mandate to go through and, and learn from all that stuff and then apply the learnings? Like why, why would they give it to a guy like yourself? Well, obviously, it wasn't to give it to a guy like me. Was the, the effort was to put it out there for the public for, for anybody to access, all research to access. And part of the reason for that was that um, there were some competing, there have been competing versions, as I said, competing versions or visions of what Al-Qaeda is all along. And my view was in order to um, better inform that debate, we should have these primary sources available to as many people as possible to inform it. And and. What happened was that there were definitely some disagreements behind closed doors within government over the files and how they were handled. Um, and I became privy to that. And I certainly um, talked to people in Congress and on the Hill and uh, former CIA director, Mike Pompeo knew my whole spiel on it and others did as well. And eventually um, as a result of me making my case that, you know, basically the public discourse would be better served if this stuff was really put out there. They decided to put it out there. And it was very contentious. And there's, there's a lot of details I'm leaving out, obviously. But um, to me, what I would what I want people to understand is that, you know, just because, as you say, you know, these, these experts in the intelligence community have access to this and can, can basically give their opinion on it and hopefully it informs that, it doesn't mean that they are um, the last word on any of this. Um, to me, you know, a lot of times, you know, knowledge needs to be spread as, as widely as possible to have as many different people looking at it to give to give their assessments of it. And we definitely found things that stick out to us, for example, just in our, with our modest resources that didn't stick out to intelligence analysts. So, um, you know, or at least not in the way it should, in, uh, in our opinion. So the bottom line is the, the more the stuff is out there, the better. And there've been definitely benefits to putting the stuff out there. I, I, I would agree with that. So in terms of bin Laden actually being involved in the day-to-day operations, what was he working on? The short answer is a lot. Um, so the best way I would describe this is, is that bin Laden received these regular, what I've termed management papers, management memos from his right-hand man, a guy known as Atia Abdelrahman, uh, a Libyan who was very, very highly regarded within Al-Qaeda and Jihad circles. He's someone who was considered to them to be an expert theologian. So he's somebody who had the right religious credentials to weigh in on all matters because that's the perspective they're coming from. Um, And Rahman really served as this basically aide de camp or general manager for Al Qaeda overseeing their operations. And he would collect, he basically acted as a funnel for all these different Al Qaeda parties around the globe to funnel information through him to bin Laden. And Atiyah, what he would do is he would comp- he would write down these management memos that would summarize all of the hot issues of that week or however whatever the period is he was reporting to Bin Laden on, whether it be sometimes it'd be a couple weeks, but usually it was on a, it was a pretty regular basis, certainly within every month of the last final months of Bin Laden's life. And those issues involved everything from um, Hamza Bin Laden, Osama's son. Um, being uh, released from Iran and how, how are they going to protect him to, um, you know, what Shabab was doing in Somalia and how that oath of allegiance from Shabab to Al-Qaeda should read and what Shabab should be doing in terms of managing its, its uh, nascent state that it's building to the affairs of what was going on in Iraq. Um, one of the names that, that pops up, of course, is Abu Baker al-Baghdadi, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, um, the future head of ISIS and the Islamic State, which declared itself to be a caliphate. At the time, he was certainly within Al Qaeda's scheme, uh, so to speak. And there's there's conversations about him taking over the Islamic State of Iraq and what that would mean. Uh, operations in Afghanistan, operations in Pakistan, um, trying to negotiate a, a ceasefire with the Pakistani government, um, dealing with Iran and the Iranians and how complex that issue is. I mean, you know, basically, I can keep going on and on and on. The, the point is, is that there are a lot more issues on Bin Laden's desk than anybody thought as of April 2011. They get these files and they realize, lo and behold, actually Bin Laden's touching on all these different matters. Yeah. And the narrative was that he was, he was just retired, right? He was just 
living in the mountains and yeah and that that that, that narrative and that narrative so let's get to let's get to it because this is why i was interested in coming on your podcast so that in my field there are a lot of narratives right and this is this is one of the narratives the narrative that was fed to um peter bergen of cnn who wrote a book on bin laden and the hunt for bin laden and to david ignatius of the washington post and to others came from the obama white house and the narrative was that bin laden was retired he was out of the game now, if you think about it, that's kind of curious, right? Why would people in the Obama White House play down bin Laden's role in Al-Qaeda, in Al-Qaeda at the time of his death? Um, because obviously this is the signature accomplishment of the Obama years is to get the head of Al-Qaeda, the guy who brought us 9-11. Um, why would they play down his importance? And the answer from my perspective is that there was a big push at the time to say, we got bin Laden, it's over, Al-Qaeda is dead, jihadism as far as it being a concern for the Americans is dead and let's get out of here and, and don't worry about this anymore. And so that was the narrative that came along with it. And so they spoon fed this idea to um, select a uh, select several people that bin Laden was in retirement. That's actually the, the phrase that, that even Bergen uses in his book. And for David Ignatius of the Washington Post, he wrote a column says that bin Laden was a lion in winter. Well, a couple things about that. One, that's not what the CIA found. The CIA, you can go to Mike Morrell, who was the acting CIA director. He has a book called something like The Great War or something along those lines. Um, it's, it's a pretty good book. Um, and he, he explains how actually, no, the file showed the exact opposite, that he was the opposite of being in retirement, the opposite of being a lion in winter. He was very much still in the game and managing these global affairs. And um, two, we, we now have the files released to the public. And I can say definitively that that narrative was wrong. Um, I could show you all sorts of ways in which bin Laden was not in retirement. And then three, of course, um, to their credit, I would say both Bergen and Ignatius basically, uh, without saying so, walk back from that conclusion that was given to them by the White House uh, back in the days. They, they basically tracked back from that and said, no, actually, you know, bin Laden was much more involved in, in managing Al-Qaeda's affairs. So um, that was a narrative that was around the files that was spoon fed to certain select people. Uh, including analysts at the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point, which put out a, a pretty flawed analysis of only 17 of the files, which was also another reason why we fought to get the files released, because this, this, the narrative that was in that assessment was that bin Laden was basically sidelined. They asked it as a question in the title and then proceeded to more or less answer it that, yes, he was. Um, so this was a spoon-fed narrative that came out during the, in 2012 from the Obama administration, and it, it sort of stuck in a lot of places and we could say definitively the files refute that narrative. Why would they want that narrative? Because in my mind, if you take a guy out and he's still at the top of his game, that seems more impressive. Well, that's what I just, that's what I just explained because that's the right question. Uh, and I had the same question. And it's because they wanted, to, they wanted to say that bin Laden was basically it. Bin Laden and a handful of others was all we really had to worry about in terms of Al-Qaeda and all these other groups out there, like the predecessor of ISIS, for example, which they subsequently labeled the JV team or Shabab in Somalia or groups fighting in Afghanistan. Or- so, so it was the overarching narrative of jihadism has, has been defeated. It's, local, it's all local now. And you don't have to really worry about any international threat to the U.S. We can retreat from everywhere and not have to worry about it. That was, that was the bigger narrative is a bigger foreign policy narrative that to set the foreign policy agenda to say, America doesn't really have to worry about these groups anymore. So let's get out of here Um, because bin Laden's dead. And that was really the only thing holding it together as a focus on the U S and that's not true either. Um, It shows a fundamental misunderstanding of all this, but, um, but that was the larger narrative. And it did, it did, you know, as I said, it, it is curious, right? I mean, you would think they would be trumpeting Bin Laden's role and, and, and showing how important he was. But to give you further evidence for what I'm saying, one of the key actors in this was John Brennan, who was the uh, counterterrorism advisor for President Obama, and he goes on to be, be CIA director. He gave a speech for the Wilson Center in 2012, in which he basically he cherry picked from the documents just as, just as Ob- President Obama did. And he said something along the lines of that, you know, uh, Osama bin Laden struggled to communicate with other Al Qaeda with Al Qaeda affiliates elsewhere. Not true. I mean, yeah, d- d- communications were disrupted at times, but I could show you a whole series of communications with multiple Al Qaeda so-called affiliates throughout all throughout the final year of his life. Just didn't make any sense. Uh, but that was all part in, in part of a narrative for Brennan in that speech that was he could envision the end of Al Qaeda within the following decade. 
Um, well, lo and behold, we, we haven't gotten there yet, but we're sitting here in 2021 and I can tell you Al Qaeda is still very much alive. So that was all false. For this podcast, I think it would be helpful for myself and the audience if we weave in and out of kind of uh, setting the stage and then getting into the, the nuance. And so a setting the stage question is, what is the difference between ISIS and Al Qaeda? And, and furthermore, based off my prior knowledge, was Zarqawi basically the, the founder of ISIS, like the, the precursor back in, I think it was like 04, 05. Was that the split? Of because uh, didn't it start from Al Qaeda in Iraq? Yeah, I, what I would do is to set the narrative even before even before we got to Bin Laden files, I would have taken a step back and just started talking about what is Al Qaeda. Um, because I, I said at the outset, there's there's that seems like a very simple question, uh, and it is a very simple question, and yet there are no simple answers. There aren't any clear answers given by a lot of people in the U.S. government. Um, you know, basically. I mean, just think think about this. Think about this way, Jeff. Um, so, the U.S. has been involved in these conflicts now for you know the better part of twenty years, and even before nine eleven was involved in hunting down Al Qaeda. Um, the last time the U.S. government produced, to my knowledge, any kind of wire diagram or overview of what Al Qaeda looked like as an organization was in two thousand four in the nine eleven commission report. Well, we're sitting here in 2021, and 17 years later, I can't think of uh, a similar overview of what Al Qaeda looks like that the U.S. government has produced during that, that the, the time the time in between then and now. Um, and that, that's a pretty big hole. I mean, it, and what I would say is it may sound strange, but there's a, there's a, a very basic epistemological problem here, which is you know what is Al Qaeda? What what is it meant to do? How is it structured? And, and how does it go about its business? And so because there's such a lack of uh, clarity on this, it opens up the field to all sorts of clearly erroneous interpretations of this. But Al-Qaeda, I think the best way to understand it um, for all this is that Al-Qaeda is, has always been a terrorist organization, sure. Um, but it's also, but terrorism was always a tactic or a tool that they used to try to achieve their political objectives. Uh, first and foremost, it has always been a revolutionary organization. Now, an evil revolutionary organization for sure. But Bin Laden and his not so merry men looked at the world in the late 1980s and they said, boy, there are all these Muslim majority governments that are not ruling according to Sharia or our interpretation of Islamic law. And we want to topple them and replace them with the austere form of governance that we favor. But how do we do that? How do we go about doing that? And at first, um, you know, there's this, this idea that Bin Laden and Al Qaeda was myopically focused on just the far enemy on the U.S., and certainly, they did make the they did end up making the U.S. the primary target for a time, but it was, the U.S. has never been their only target. Um, they were also focused on all these so-called near enemies, so these local regimes. They just failed to overthrow them. They failed to overthrow, you know, jihadists failed to overthrow the government of Egypt. They failed to overthrow Gaddafi um, for a long time, anyway. In Libya, they failed to overthrow um, the Assad regime, and so the idea was. When we look at it from this perspective, from Jaws' perspective, they thought, well, why is it that we're failing to overthrow these regimes? And they came to believe that everything was tied into this Zionist crusader conspiracy and that the U.S. was propping up this entire system and that they needed to weaken or strike and strike the U.S. in such a fashion the U.S. would recede from the world and that would loosen up the – create the political space for their jihadi revolution so that basically hit the U.S. and then they could topple what was then the Hazim Mubarak's regime in Egypt – or the Saudi regime, or any one of these others, and the U.S. wouldn't come to their come to their aid, and then they could then put in place their jihadi government. So, so uh, it that was not that makes sense. Does that yeah, make sense to you as a basic overview? Yeah, it, it does make sense. I I was under the impression that Bin Laden's goal was in in nine eleven was to actually draw us in and create a a divide between the West and Islam. So. There were always two competing and contradictory um, reasons given for 9-11 and 9-11 style attacks. Remember, you have the embassy bombings before that. You have the USS Cole sure. attack. You have other plots. There are always two competing and contradictory uh, sort of rationales given uh, for that within Al-Qaeda. The first was, if we hit them, 
it'll drive them out, just like the Iranians and Hezbollah drove the U.S. out of Lebanon in 1983. So following, remember the attacks, the simultaneous attacks on the U.S. embassy and the French, the headquarters of the French paratroopers in Lebanon in 1983, the U.S. eventually retreated from Lebanon. And um, basically that was, Bin Laden was watching, um, probably then from Pakistan or Afghanistan. And that was a big sign to him that America was a paper tiger in his words. And then he looked at what happened with Black Hawk Down in Somalia in the early 1990s, uh, an event that Al-Qaeda certainly had a heavy hand in. And he saw how the U.S. got out of Somalia after that. And he thought, well, you know, this confirmed his suspicion or his idea that basically if we hit them hard enough, they'll just get out of all these areas and that will open up the space for us, to, for the jihadis to launch their political revolution. So that was the first idea behind it. Um, obviously, that didn't happen. Um, you know, obviously, the U.S. didn't fall back from the world. The U.S. went in and toppled the Taliban's regime in Afghanistan and then went forward with the what turned out to be strategically disastrous Iraq war and various other actions. And so at that point, the rationale shifts from if we hit them hard enough, we'll force them out right now to we'll we'll draw them in and bleed them dry. And then eventually they'll go home. And when they go home, they won't come back. And so that's the model they've been pursuing ever since for the last 20 years, basically, for most of the last 20 years, since since the aftermath of 9-11 anyway. Um, and what you can find within the Al-Qaeda discourse is that those two competing ideas will sit next to each other at times in a very uh, uncomfortable way. But those those have been the two primary reasons given at, given at any given time. Does that make sense to you? It does make sense. It's... It sounds like it's an ever-evolving organization, which is why we have a hard time of defining it, is, is what you're talking about, in, in what they what their objectives are. I do want to go back even a little bit further to the origin stories here. So as you know, uh, you know my, my knowledge in this space is basically the reading The Looming Tower. And you know that, that book goes deep into how Bin Laden was... Uh, basically just a rich kid who uh, who took his money and went and established this services bureau in Afghanistan during the fight with the Soviets. And correct me if I'm, I'm butchering this at all. He actually, he worked with the, it's uh, Maktab al-Kidmat uh, as the services bureau. That was actually established by Abdul Azam uh, with whom was Bin Laden worked. And That's Azam right. is, Azam is basically the godfather of modern jihadism. He's the one who issued the, original fatwas or religious edicts that said that jihad is incumbent on all Muslims as long as any Muslim land the size of even one hand is occupied by the infidels. It's then incumbent on individual Muslims around the world to wage jihad until that, that land is liberated. And he, that fatwa obviously applied to Afghanistan, but it applied to elsewhere as well. Uh, and, and, and that's how it was written. And Azam worked closely with Bin Laden until his mysterious death in 1989. Right. That's, ahead, sorry. Did, did, did Bin Laden kill Azam? I, I think that's highly doubtful. Um, obviously, nobody really knows who killed Azam. I don't. Uh, I don't know of any real evidence that he did. Um, there's another competing theory that Egyptians who were working with Bin Laden, including people in Zawahiri, I mean, Zawahiri circle, were responsible. I don't. I don't find. Any, I haven't found any persuasive evidence along those lines at all. Um, the bottom line is, we don't know to this day. Okay, so Zawahiri, that's that's someone I'm I'm very interested in in hearing about. So back in the '80s, I believe late '80s, they you know Bin Laden and Zawahiri link up, and I guess the story is that Bin Laden is the one funding a lot of this stuff. Maybe he's got the grand dreams, but that Zawahiri is more of an operator. Perhaps he's 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 more of uh he's he's more studied in the religious text. Is that all correct? How does Zawahiri enter the picture and and team up with Bin Laden? You know, I mean, that's certainly the, the impression you get from some of Lawrence Wright's writings is that Zawahiri is the man behind bin Laden. And I just would always be careful with these types of dichotomies in terms of how we describe these guys. I mean, they, the way I look at it is they had a partnership and, you know, neither one of them um, was, uh, you know, neither one of them only had a few talents. They both had multiple talents that they brought to this terror this partnership in terror. And Zawahiri certainly is a highly intellectual jihadi. He's somebody who has a, clearly an above average IQ. Um, he was a doctor, obviously, in Egypt. He comes from a, a very affluent family in Egypt. He chose the jihadi path. Um, he's somebody who, to my mind, is actually the most underestimated jihadi of all time. Um, he, in all likelihood, although we can't say for certain, in all likelihood, he's still alive somewhere in the Afghanistan, Pakistan region. And if you think about that, and this is why I always say to to anybody when I talk about this is, uh, 
imagine if you were hunted by the world's lone, what was, well, America was a superpower, I would say, for part of the period after 9-11. I doubt that it is now. Uh, but hunted by America and other powers for decades at a time, could you survive on the lamb? This guy has. Um, I know I couldn't. I don't think I could at all. I don't think that would be possible. But he has. And he still has thousands of jihadis who are loyal to him around the globe, despite all the management problems he has overseen or, or had to deal with. Um, but he was he was always a close partner of Bin Laden going back to the late 1980s, as you said. Um, he's somebody who certainly left his imprint on what we know as Al Qaeda from really from the first days of the organization. So we don't know if he's still alive. Uh, I, I assume that that means that we don't know if he's still active. Well, I'd, 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 I'd be very careful. So when I when I say I would say we don't know that he's dead, I don't see any real evidence that he's dead. Um, you know, I see some very specious reports on Twitter from sources I don't trust saying that. And then uh, I don't think that's accurate. I do know, for example, that there are indications that he's been active. Um, for example, I mean, they're not recent within the last couple of months, but then again, this is a clandestine organization. We're not going to know much about its inner workings, but I'll give you one example from not so distant past in 2019, September, 2019, um, the U S and its Afghan allies killed a courier who was running messages back and forth between the head of Al Qaeda and the Indian subcontinent, which is the Al Qaeda group principally responsible for fighting in Afghanistan on behalf of the organization between the head of that group, who was Asim Omar, who was killed in the raid and Zawahiri. Um, and so we know there's been traffic going back and forth to Zawahiri. I've seen reports of it since then. I've seen reports of it as, as uh, into 2020 that in fact, Zawahiri was even consulting with the Taliban uh, including the Haqqanis or another organization. that's very interesting. We could do a whole other series of podcasts on them if we wanted to uh, uh, about the, the so-called peace talks between the U S and the Taliban. Zawahiri was talking to various Taliban figures about that. So there are indications he's been active at least, you know, at different points in 2020, this rumor came about late 2020 that he was dead, but I don't see any, I don't, I have not seen any evidence to justify that rumor. I would say my naked, guess on why we have not been able to go out and kill him whether that is the will or the ability um, or both is that the way that policy in practice actually gets implemented is based off of narratives and that's how the public understands the world and america loves thinking about organizations with you know the the uh the Oh, I'm blanking on the term now. The, <laughs> the the great man. That's what it is. The great man, right? So companies are built by a great man. You have the, the president acting alone. And so my thought here is that perhaps all of our will or ability was all focused on bin Laden and going back into that narrative. Um, because I don't think the public really knows who Zawahiri is. I, I don't think a, a majority of the public knows. So why would we waste resources if you're a politician to say, hey, we got this guy that may or may not be active and nobody really knows who he is? Is, th is there any truth to that? Am I in the right direction? There's some truth to that. What I would say is this. I think I totally agree with the latter point. I don't think the public at large knows who Zawahiri is. And then a lot of the people who are actually experts on this matter, subject matter, will poo-poo him uh, immediately. And I think wrongly. I think for a lot of reasons wrongly. Um, you know, it's obvious from the Bin Laden files, which you asked about earlier, that Zawahiri was very much weighing in on all sorts of decisions and guiding people as far away as West Africa uh, within the Al Qaeda network. This is somebody who has always had an immense cadre behind him. Uh, it's not it's not the case that he is um, some spent force who never had any any pull within the jihadi or, uh, movement or within Al Qaeda. He always did. Um, and, and there there was, you asked too about the rise of ISIS. We'll get back to that, I'm sure, in a second. But um, certainly the rise of ISIS caused a lot of problems for him. But as part of that rise of ISIS, one of the things that was interesting is you, that the Al-Qaeda loyalists, some of them came out of the woodwork and you could see just how much influence Al-Qaeda, uh, I'm sorry, Zawahiri had over them in Syria or Yemen or in different places in Africa. So, um, you know, this is a guy who has been underestimated, I would say, by a lot of people. That's probably played into it. I think I wouldn't say that he that the America hasn't put any resources into trying to kill him. They certainly have. The, the CIA and others have. If you remember in 2009, there was the um, suicide bombing at Camp Chapman in Afghanistan. And the suicide bomber was a Jordanian doctor who the CIA and Jordanian intelligence thought could deliver Zawahiri to uh, 
U.S. intelligence, give his whereabouts as we could actually, the U.S. could actually locate him and kill him. And in fact, he was a, a double agent, a spy who was actually working on behalf of Al Qaeda, and he blew himself up, killing some CIA officers and others in the process. Uh, very uh, what that the trail on that operation leads back to Zawahiri himself. This is where this is one of the ways he's been underestimated. This is a guy who detected that the CIA was closing in on him, on him potentially, or was looking for him, and set and helped along with his lieutenants, including T. the Rockman, the guy I mentioned earlier. They set this trap for the CIA. Uh, this is something where you know let's give the guy as evil as he is a little credit for being an intellectual, an intellectual who's very cagey. Um, so that's part of the story too. I think it's absolutely right. As you mentioned that the U S certainly is not devoted the lion's share of its high value targeting to Zawahiri, but it has devoted some of it to it, to him. And he just is a very cagey old guy. Now we, you're right. We will get to ISIS. I want to ask you an open-ended question because I know that a lot of your work has deals with, depicting the structure actual actual structure on the ground of how al-qaeda operates and i know you're familiar with all of the deputies um, and how information goes back and forth and so getting back to trying to wrap our hands around what al-qaeda wants um, how does their day-to-day operations perhaps map to your understanding of, of of what they want because it does not seem like, uh, at least they're out of the news, right? So it, it's kind of hard from afar to understand that. Well, they're they're out of the news and they're in the news every day if you know what to look for. Um, so part of, part of the issue is that this idea took hold that, that Al-Qaeda is only interested in attacking the U.S. and the West. And then an argument was papered on top of that, that if they fail to do so, then they've been defeated and they're a defunct organization. That's completely false. Their their original reason for existence was to, as fanciful as it seemed to U.S. policymakers at the time and at given time since then, the principal um, objective for Al Qaeda is to resurrect an Islamic caliphate. So when ISIS comes along in 2013, 2014, and says, "Tada, we did it," this was not something that was new within the jihadi movement or jihadi organizations. This is something Al Qaeda had been talking about since the late 1980s, certainly throughout the 1990s. And then even after, well, after nine, uh, nine 11, um, in their scheme, they want to build these Islamic emirates in these different places. These are sort of the state, the states, the print, the, the fiefdoms to, that are going to be overseen by the different princes. Um, and then these states or Islamic emirates would link up in their scheme to form a new caliphate. Um, the Islamic State of Iraq grew into the Islamic State of Iraq and the Sham, or as ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Um, this was originally one of these um, regional groups under the Al Qaeda hierarchy that was supposed to build its emirate in Iraq that would ultimately become part of a reimagined new caliphate. And what happens is that Abu Bakr al Baghdadi and his lieutenants say basically they're the lieutenants in this scheme. If you think about it like a mafia for a second, they're basically the lieutenants to the Don and Zawahiri is the Don and Baghdad is the lieutenant. And he says, you know what? I don't want to be a lieutenant anymore. I want to be the Don and we're going to go for it. We're going to, and there's all these arguments between them and, and Al Qaeda behind the scenes, Al Qaeda senior leadership. And so eventually Baghdad, he just does his own thing and, and breaks away and Al Qaeda disowns him and he, he declares the caliphate and the rest is history. Um, but th- that was very much an organizational schism or break within this, this quest to build a caliphate. If you look, when I say, if you know what to look for, you can see Al Qaeda in the news every day. Well, the other parts of Al Qaeda did not follow much. I would say much of the rest of the other parts of Al Qaeda or many of the other parts of Al Qaeda did not follow the ISIS path. Some of them did, but most of them didn't. And so if you look at right now in Afghanistan, where the U S is retreating from Afghanistan, as we, as we record this, um, the Al Qaeda is heavily invested in resurrecting the Taliban's Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Well, why is it called the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan? Because that's one of these so-called emirates that would link up in a new imagined caliphate. And the fighting there rages on a day-to-day basis. Al Qaeda is executing operations probably every day, certainly every week, and multiple times every week. Um, it's just that, that that's where their resources are devoted right now. For the, the lion's share of the resources are to reclaim that emirate on behalf of the Taliban with the Taliban. Um, then you have Shabab in Somalia. What are they trying to do? Well, that's a, that's a, a branch of Al Qaeda that's openly loyal to Ayman al-Zawahiri, repeatedly so. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to build an emirate in East Africa. And you have Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen, which gained garnered a lot of attention because of the Detroit bombing and uh, the attempted bombing of a Detroit bound airliner in December 2009. 
and a series of other attacks, planned attacks against the U.S. Well, that's true. The AQAP has threatened the U.S. and tried to launch these operations and tried to inspire other lone jihadis to do so and had a hand in events such as the December 2019 uh, shooting at Fort, uh, Naval Air Station Pensacola. But that's not AQAP's primary reason for existence. Their pre- primary reason for existence uh, for Al Qaeda Peninsula is to build an emirate in Yemen and then expand it into Saudi Arabia and take over the whole Arabian Peninsula. Then you go to West Africa, you have Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb and its various offshoots or new formed entities, including one known as Janim, which is known in, in English as the Group for the Support of Islam and Muslims. Um, they're trying to form an emirate in West Africa. You remember back in, in 2011, 2012, the jihadis took over a lot of Mali. What was the point of that? The point of that was to build this emirate that would then link up with other emirates to reform the caliphate. And then in Syria, you have a muddled picture, but there's a lot of detail I'm giving you there, but, and I can, I'm, I'm sparing you, Jeff and listeners, all the names of the guys who are running these operations. <laughs> Cause I could certainly go into them. Uh, but, but the bottom line is that there's still very much an international Al Qaeda organization. That's, that's launching attacks on a day-to-day basis across this huge land sp- expanse. It's just not well understood to Americans because it's never been articulated to them that this is what they're about. This is what they're doing. Um, and they continue to do it and they're going to continue to do it even as the U.S. retreats from these fights. Um, and the question really becomes in the long run, you know, some places they have a better chance of success than others. But the point is that um, Al Qaeda is very much in the news. You, just again, if you know what to look for. This could definitely be a uh, three or four hour podcast. We don't, I don't, we don't have you for that long today, but I think, I think that's obvious. I, I, well, you walked into a problem here. I've had three cups of coffee and I'm a fast talking New Yorker as it is. And so I'm a well caffeinated fast talking New Yorker. So that's a big problem. But well, it's, it's, it's <laughs> and, been... and I'm a nerd and I'm a nerd and that's all I do is study this stuff. So, you know, it's, that's the problem. <laughs> well, it's it's been reported on this podcast that the audience of the podcast is also highly caffeinated. So there's a there's a match there. Don't worry about it. Uh, the the we'll, we'll get into I really want to get into what's going on in Afghanistan with the pullout. Now, I I don't know how you feel about military involvement uh, of the United States uh, across the world. What would you say to the argument of let's just let these guys have it out over there? It's been 20 20 plus years. And I know that, you know, there's that narrative around, okay, we're pulling, we, we finally pulled out of Afghanistan. Well, we still have, special operation soldiers in 140 countries around the globe actively. So it's not that the, you know, that, that was basically just a headline, I think, but we obviously did pare back a lot of our, took out a lot of our troops in Afghanistan and what's going on there. So what would you say to complete isolationism or however you want to take that question about how to approach it from a military aspect? I mean, would they just leave us alone? Um, No, uh, the short answer is no, but uh, look, I, I think, We've come through this period after 9-11 where I think you had basically the Bush administration overreached, obviously, with the Iraq war, and there were a lot of consequences from that, and that has basically colored the conversation of a lot of different events since then. Um, the Bo- President Obama came in, and he wanted to – remember, he, he claimed to bring the Iraq war to a responsible end. You know, ISIS rises, whoops, you know, and then he claimed he was going to do the same thing in Afghanistan. He was going to bring that war to a responsible end, and he decided to keep less than 10,000 troops there. Um, the bottom line is that you have this sort of massive buildup during the Bush years because of the Iraq war and the surge there, and then the increasing need for forces in Afghanistan, you peak at about 200,000 troops across those two theaters, um, sometime about a decade ago or a little bit more. And then by the end of the Obama administration, which you're talking about December of 2016, January, 2017, as president Trump comes in, that number is far lower. I mean, you're talking about, um, you know, it's definitely less than 30,000. It's tough to get a total handle on it because they, the Pentagon is, you know, a little squirrely when it comes to reporting on numbers. But across Iraq, then at that point, a minor contingent in Syria and Afghanistan, it's certainly less than 30,000 at that point across all three, probably less than 25,000, maybe even less than 20,000 total uh, across all those. So you have, you basically, you have this massive expansion of the American footprint to fight the jihadis and then this contraction or Obama then you have President Trump comes in and he he adds a few thousand troops to Afghanistan initially and then pulls them back. And he adds a, some smaller uh, increase in forces to Syria and Iraq to, to fight ISIS and then pulls them back. But basically, the overall picture doesn't change. It's just sort of reduced down to this, you know, 
uh, much reduced foot, uh, footprint, I would say, until the very end of the Trump administration when he pulls out. At this point, you now have 700 troops in Somalia, which is a small growing presence there. He pulls them out. He pulls out. Um, he gets the troop presence in Afghanistan down to 3,500. That's what President Biden inherits. And then you still have small contingents in, in Iraq and Syria. But uh, by the time President Biden takes office, you're talking about really less than 10,000 uh, troops in these different theaters. So the point is, and, and these are true presences that are not, for, uh, fortunately, at this point, are not taking, he- we're not taking heavy casualties. That's an important point, too. And there, there are a lot of circumstances surrounding that, which I won't get into all of them. But, but the point is, is that they definitely were not taking a lot of casualties. So the idea is, what exactly are we talking about when you talk about the American presence in different places? Because I think when we have these conversations, a lot of times people are reacting to the Iraq war and the, the surge in forces and this the massive expansion, which is, which is of course was problematic. And I, you know, if we go back in time and change that, I would. Um, but that's certainly not the picture that president Trump inherited. And it's not the picture that president Biden inherited. The question is, should the U S keep and reframing the question, should the U S keep small contingents of troops in places like Afghanistan to stand up local partners and allies who are on the front lines to get the jihadis. And right now, basically the answer from president Biden is no. So the U S is the 3,500 troops he inherited in Afghanistan are going to be pulled out probably by sometime this summer. Um, he intends to get mostly, if not all out of Iraq and Syria as well. And so these smaller contingents are going to be out and it just raises a lot of questions. I mean, yes, you know, are these guys going to leave us alone? The jihadis? I mean, no, there's all sorts of intelligence that they're not going to leave us alone. Um, there's gotta be some way for the U S to monitor these groups. Um, after the withdrawal, it's going to get more difficult to do so. It's going to get more difficult to do so if they start taking territory and are, are proclaimed victors in places like Afghanistan. We saw what the victory message did for ISIS. It drove it, 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 it uh, drew in tens of thousands of volunteers from around the globe. I think you can you could easily see a similar dynamic in some of these places like Afghanistan going forward. Um, that could be a big problem uh, in terms of monitoring all this uh, in, in the years to come. But the question is, you know, to my mind, I can articulate the counter terrorism rationale for keeping these troops in place and a small contingents in place and keep fighting in these areas and standing up local forces. But on the flip side, I can tell you, and this is where I get, I get where people, I think their ears perk up. I think there's just been such a massive leadership failure here that people, that the military leadership, the political leadership of this country, the U S can't explain any of this to anybody at this point in any reasonable way. And so it's very tough given those circumstances for me to support any, any sort of ongoing presence in any of these countries, I would say. It certainly does not seem like there has been a plan that has been followed through on. It seems that, at least as a member of the public, we continue to get jerked around a little bit in terms of what's what's constantly going on, and it, and it just turns into a political football opposed to, you know, what, what is the long term goal? What are your thoughts on on keeping a the the presence of special operations in in these countries, which, you know, we could go into, you know, is that authorized by Congress or not, but it is happening. So is that kind of the silent fail safe that, that the U S is implementing right now? Well, a couple of things. I mean, one, the U S is going to be fully out of Afghanistan. So there's not going to be any special operations forces even um, other than to protect the embassy potentially in the coming months. They're certainly not going to be involved in any serious war fighting in the country. Um, and I think it'd be, it'd be tough for them to even protect the embassy after, after a while. Um, but, you know, but let's, let's explore the question you asked about the, you know, congressional authorization a little bit, because I'm, I'm very much in the camp that this stuff shouldn't be on autopilot, that there should be congressional authorization for the use of force. And the, yep. the, the needs, there needs to be that level of oversight, and Congress has basically punted on these issues and hasn't done its constitutional duty in authorizing this. I mean, it's, it's what I've said. People have a hard time understanding this, like when I talk about these groups, because they think, well, you, you just want to justify keeping the U.S. in these places. I'm like, if you actually knew everything I knew, you wouldn't want you wouldn't be saying that, you know, uh, at, at all. You know, uh, but but the point is, like, you know, I'll give you an example, Jeff, on, on what you're talking about. So um, take take Shabab and Somalia. I teased the 700 troops that were in Somalia. Let's talk about that for a second. It's absolutely the case that Shabab is part of Al Qaeda. Okay. Anybody who tells you it isn't, it's just full of it. It just is. There's just a huge encyclopedia of information at this point about what Shabab is. It's definitely part of Al Qaeda's 
stratagem, part of its scheme for what it's trying to do. Um, but there really hasn't been any conversation or direct congressional authorization for the use of force in Somalia um, outside of the 2001 AUMF, which was, I mean, I don't, I'm probably going to get tangled up here. Maybe the lawyers out there are going to say, well, no, there's some other provision that, you know, that the U.S. was able to act under fine. But the point is that there was never any real discussion about what should the U.S. be doing with special forces in Somalia. It, it, never, was, it never was a case where there was a debate on the House floor, let's say, on a resolution to whether or not the U.S. should have a small presence in Somalia to combat Shabab, which is al-Qaeda's presence there. And so, um, you know, I think that's a problem because I think – what happens is I think that opens up the door for all this ignorance I'm talking about on these issues. Right. I mean, we don't, we don't get to the point of having a conversation of where should we really intervene when the U S military is on autopilot and it's just helping local forces or intervening in these different places um, without congressional oversight. If that makes sense to you. Like I think, I think to me, that's part of what this should be about. Right. And if the U S if the, the elected representatives of the American public say, no, we don't want to be in Somalia. Okay, well, then we don't want to be in Somalia. You know, I'm not going to stand in your way, you know. But the point is that, that debate never really happens the way this went down, if that makes sense. It does make sense. I think that congressional reform has been uh, a, a past topic on this podcast, and that's a whole can of worms that I don't, I don't think we want to get into. But uh, in terms of the haste towards not not only just like the elites in general, but towards the foreign policy community. It sounds like you're saying that a lot of that comes from the fact that the public is not cued in on on this stuff. And it's not even, you know, they, they find out that somebody dies and it's like, oh, well, I didn't even know we had people in, in Somalia. And that is the troops, in, the, the, troops in Niger, the, the troops in Niger are a great example of that killed by ISIS, right? You know, we had several troops killed a couple of years back in Niger, you know, hunting ISIS, and nobody even knew they were there doing that. Uh, very few people did. Um, and look, I mean, this is this is the way I look at this stuff is, is um, and by the way, so here, here's what's interesting about all this and why there's all these twists and turns to all this stuff. One of, the, one of the expressions I've coined is the disconnected dots crowd. So a lot of the, just as I said, there's no analytic agreement on what Al-Qaeda is, for example. One of the main reasons for that is because if, in the way a lot of analysts or experts think, and I've debated these people, is if you say that Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, the Islamic Maghreb is Al Qaeda, right? Then the U.S. is going to intervene militarily there. So then they create all these arguments to justify their tortuous interpretation of an Al Qaeda group not being Al Qaeda. I mean, it's just logically absurd, right? My view has always been different, right? Um, I think it's obvious that Al Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb, which is headquartered in West Africa now is part of Al-Qaeda. I can give you all sorts of nerdy details if you want to dispute me on that, right? And I can debate you on that all day. Um, but it clearly is. It's why it's called Al-Qaeda, right? Um, but that doesn't mean I want the Marines to go into Mali, right? I mean, you have to be able to bifurcate your analysis of what, what these groups are and what the jihadi threat is versus what you think should be done about it. And the problem is that this is all messed up, like, you know, because you have the U.S. military on autopilot. So a lot of times they don't even really understand the groups that they're helping to intervene against. They don't, and believe me, that's absolutely true in Afghanistan after all these years. You can, you, there's a lot of confusion about what, who they're even fighting in Afghanistan. Um, you have the U.S. military sort of on autopilot on these issues. Then you have this expert or analytical cadre, which is saying, no, none of these groups are really part of Al-Qaeda or pose a threat, and so the U.S. shouldn't be fighting any of them. And then, you know, I think I don't want to play the, the game of the truth is somewhere in between, but the, probably the truth is somewhere in between. You know, the U.S. should have some ability to counter, you know, the the worst of the terrorist threats coming our way. Um, that certainly would have helped against ISIS, for example, when it was rising. But this a more nuanced debate about all this, a more, you know, uh, uh, limited framework for understanding this stuff is is sort of out of our grasp at this point because it's all or nothing. It's all either... You know, either the U.S. is involved in an endless war, in Afghanistan, or, you know, we're getting right. out of everywhere. And that's the narrative. Right. Uh, let me throw you a curveball for a second and give you a total hypothetical. If we would have got bin Laden at Tora Bora, how much different would the country and, and world affairs look like? Well, it's something I don't know if you saw my my tweets on this or if you heard me talk about this before, but I, I've posed this hypothetical myself because I, you know, I run a website called the long war journal and that's not because I'm I've ever pined for this to be a long war. Right. I, I, I would have very much preferred all this to be a short war. We could, could not think about, it. I mean, 2001, 
I was an economist and I could have very much stayed in finance or economics and not done any of this. Uh, I probably would have preferred, quite frankly, to have done so. Uh, but the the thing is, is that if the U.S. had gotten bin Laden and Zawahiri and really the Al Qaeda senior leadership annihilated most of them in 2001, I think the picture probably would have been very different. Um, I think it mattered that the U.S. didn't get him, uh, didn't get these guys, the, the main guys in 2001. And what I would say, by the time the U.S. finally did catch up with bin Laden in 2011, the picture was very different. Um, you know, bin Laden was a jihadi revolutionary. He wanted to spark his revolution. I would say he succeeded, um, partly because of uh, American errors, partly because of his own savvy and his own skill and the skill of his um, loyalists like Ayman al-Zawahiri and others, and, and the potency of the ideology in certain places, even though it's a very much a minority, a small minority, really, of the overall broader Muslim community, of course, uh, is jihadi, a very small percentage of it, but still big enough to be demographically a problem. Um, and then they exploited all these local conditions in places like Somalia and West Africa and the Pashtun belt and uh, straddling Afghanistan, and Pakistan to their own advantages. They had certain demographic factors to their play. But the point is that if the U.S. had gotten bin Laden and his not so merry men in late 2001, I mean, really most, if not all of them, I don't think that the, the world would have looked the same way. I think that you know he he was the evil great man of history who helped spark a jihadi revolution, and that's part of the reason why we're dealing with it now. That one stings. To be honest, that 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 one stings to think about. In I well, think Jeff, was, well, Jeff, let, well, Jeff, let me give you one follow-on thing there. And I know I talk a lot, but let me give you one follow-on. No, I love this. It. Is the, the this is the narrative monopoly, right? Uh, that is right. Uh, so let's talk about a narrative. One of the narratives is is that the U.S. led invasion of Afghanistan in 2001 was an overwhelming success. I've been challenging that narrative for years. Is that narrative true? I don't think so. I don't think overthrowing a ragtag regime like the Taliban that didn't have an air force and didn't have any real conventional military forces to speak of, um, but failing to get bin Laden, Zawahiri, and the other masterminds and com chief components of Al-Qaeda, and failing to get Mul Omar, who steadfastly um, defied the U.S. and refused to turn over bin Laden, and in fact was working with bin Laden, contrary to what some people claim, failing to get him. Right. I don't think that that was that was a successful operation. I think it was a failure. I think overthrowing a ragtag Taliban regime is not really some big military success. In 2001, the all American pressure should have been brought to bear to get these guys as quickly as possible and end it. Right. And say, that's it. We're not going to let you keep going. And instead, for a lot of complicated reasons, and I don't, I don't know ultimately whose fault it is. I think it's probably multiple people, uh, multiple Americans' faults. Unfortunately, they went in with this cockamamie, half-assed plan into Afghanistan, and that's part of the reason why the jihad is raging in Afghanistan this many years later. I would say the Taliban and Al Qaeda in Iraq right now. You wrote, you recently wrote a piece titled "The Taliban and Al Qaeda Are Closing In on Afghanistan's Provincial Capitals." And let me, let me read the, uh, the summary part that you have on there. For the past two decades, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda have waged an insurgency against the Afghan government. They have pursued a fairly basic strategy, seize the rural areas while preparing the ground for an assault on population centers. They have woven nooses around at least several, Afghan several of Afghanistan's provincial capitals, knowing that they would eventually tighten the rope. That day has come. What's going on over there? Well, it's just a classic, classic Maoist insurgency. You know, Al Qaeda and the Taliban's military commanders have studied Mao, and the the one of the principal, you know, Maoist techniques is to capture the rural terrain, surround the populated centers, and eventually take the population centers when when the when the circumstances shift in your direction. Um, and in this case, it's the the principal selling point or benefit to the U.S. and NATO having forces in Afghanistan from a war fighting perspective has been that the provincial capitals of Afghanistan have remained out of the jihadis clutches as the U S and NATO now withdraws and is that presence is coming to an end. The Taliban is and Al Qaeda have decided that they can start to expend the man manpower that's necessary to take and hold these provincial capitals. So they've, they've been testing this for a while now. We've, we were, we were documenting this as far back as 2015, what they do is that in some cases they would go in and, and capture a provincial capital, but they wouldn't expend the manpower uh, 
to hold it because they knew that the U.S. with its superior special operations capability and air power could come in and save the day and, and keep the, the capital from falling. But now these capitals, without that capacity in Afghanistan, now it's the time has come for the Taliban to, to launch. It's quickly, quickly approaching that they're going to launch their full-fledged offensive. We haven't seen the full thing yet. We're going to, we're, they're just priming the pump. They're getting ready for it. And they want to overthrow these provincial capitals because that's the, the, the first key to taking back all of Afghanistan and resurrecting an Islamic Emirate. And so it, you have the potential now of sometime in the next year or so of seeing hundreds of thousands of people fall under, perhaps even more, perhaps even millions, fall under Taliban al-Qaeda rule, which means that they will then be subjected to the Islamic law as, the, as they see it. Um, now, of course, as I also write in the piece, life in these provincial capitals is, is far from idyllic. This is not, you know, some, I'm not paying some rosy scenario of Afghanistan, but certainly I would say for the Afghan civilians, for many of them, they would certainly prefer to be under this um, makeshift problematic corrupt government than they would be under the Taliban al-Qaeda. But unfortunately, the, uh, the Taliban jihadi governance is coming. With the quote unquote peace talks, I mean, did we basically just take the L? Take the L is a good way of putting it. Yeah, this, this was a see. The thing is, as I, I actually argued with these the people who were behind this at the time, I said, look, if the time has come to get out of Afghanistan, just get out of Afghanistan. You don't have to capitulate to the Taliban. You don't have to surrender to the Taliban and grant them all sorts of concessions. Unfortunately, um, the Trump administration, instead of just getting out of Afghanistan, took this approach. The peace talks have always been a farce. There's there's there there are no peace talks. This is all a Washington construct. The Taliban just showed up in Doha and said, you know, we're here for our concessions. Thanks for showing up. And the U.S. gave them a number of concessions. And then the Taliban went right back to its war fighting, uh, never stopped, launched offensives. What they said was basically the only thing the U.S. got out of this was the Taliban said, all right, we'll let you guys retreat without attacking Americans, um, you know, as we can. And so we'll let you we'll let you retreat out of here. That's it. You didn't really need to have this this uh, phony pretense of peace talks to achieve that. You could have re- reached a deal that was that simple with the Taliban to say, look, either you let us retreat um, and or you're going to force us to bomb you as we retreat. And basically, I think the Taliban would have given us the deal and just said, you know, get out. But instead, they uh, really the State Department built this entire house of cards, which is all nonsense about you know how the Taliban portraying the Taliban as an actor that was actually interested in peace and a political reconciliation, and that was willing to break with Al Qaeda. And absolutely none of that was true. None of it. Does the Taliban have an appetite to sponsor another Bin Laden type figure? I mean, what's what's the because that's originally why we went after them, right? It was because they were harboring Bin Laden, and I mean, outside of the fact that. Uh, you know, they're going to make the average Afghani citizens life hell. What is the incentive right. to beat back the Taliban? Is it the bin Laden sponsorship 2.0? No, it's a good question. I mean, you know, obviously if it were just about, you know, there are a lot of bad regimes out there and the U S can't go and topple them all to try and free the people underneath them. It's just not, not the, right. the world. It's not, not a good use of American, not a smart or wise use of American resources. Um, so it's a good question. I would say, you know, just, just to put a fine point on it, when it comes to pre 9 11 Afghanistan, Taliban apologists, and there, these are, these are these creatures in the counterterrorism world who basically have invented this fictional narrative about the Taliban to say that they weren't really in bed with Al Qaeda prior to 9 11 or, or even today. That's just total nonsense. I mean, you know, all 19 hijackers were trained in Afghanistan. Yeah, it's true. They came from different places and they went to different places afterwards, but that plot, came together in Afghanistan. It would not have come together without the safe haven that bin Laden and Al Qaeda had in safe in Afghanistan. It allowed to operate training camps, it allowed them to indoctrinate, recruit, and identify talent for an 9-11 style operation. If you remember in 1996, bin Laden is ejected from the Sudan. He doesn't have a place to go until he gets a welcoming party in Afghanistan. And the Taliban absolutely welcomes him. You can see it in the 9-11 Commission report. And Mullah Omar refuses to break with bin Laden or give him up and in fact, there's some evidence he even approved it in some cases of what bin Laden was doing. And you can see in, in Will Omar's own rhetoric in a Voice of America interview he gives in 2001, September 2001, after 9-11, he basically is repeating all the Al-Qaeda talking points about that and other attacks. So there's just a wealth of evidence about the integration of, of Al-Qaeda into the Taliban's operations in Afghanistan prior to 9-11. The story has evolved, but it's very much remains the same case to this day. 
The difference now is that Al Qaeda doesn't need Afghanistan to train all 19 hijackers like they did prior to 9-11 because they can train them anywhere. Uh, not anywhere, but in several countries now. And so now the, the threat, it has definitely, is definitely distributed. The issue for me is that, um, yes, I think the threat of global terrorism goes up as, as the jihadis make gains in Afghanistan, but it's not as simple as saying um, we need to stay there to prevent another 9-11. Because they could they could try something big in the West and probably not a 9-11 style attack, but something similar. They could try something big in the West again, but use other countries as staging grounds for them. Uh, you know, for example, Somalia, where Shabab is, or Yemen, where AQP is, or Syria, or West Africa. There's all sorts of places they could could conceivably launch something from, um, or all of them, in fact. Uh, you know, they could have parts of it come from these different places. The issue is that if you think about what the rise of ISIS did to the global jihadi movement, it was a huge shot in the arm. It created all these secondary and tertiary problems for the West, for the Europe and U the U.S. in terms of monitoring counterterrorism threat, monitoring terrorism threats, and having the counterterrorism services keep on top of it. I think the victory in Afghanistan, it should the Taliban and Al Qaeda win and resurrect the Islamic Emirate, will be a boon for the global jihadi movement and will have those same types of secondary and tertiary effects and will undoubtedly increase the terrorist threat globally, is what I would say. What is the goal of Al-Qaeda? Or Al-Qaeda, sorry. Well, like I said earlier, the goal is to build this caliphate. Now, they're far away from that, and it's been dismissed by American policymakers at times. You remember, I, I cited earlier a speech by John Brennan, who was then the chief counterterrorism advisor to President Obama yeah. in 2012, and he, in that same speech, he said that the we're not going to organize our counterterrorism policies around the, the jihadis' goal of, res, of building a caliphate because that's an absurd, feckless delusion. So absurd and feckless delusion were his phrases. And that was, two, that was June 2012. I think it was, um, or was it June 2011? Maybe it was June, no, I think it was June 2012. In any event, it was basically a few years to the day that ISIS declared its caliphate in Iraq and Syria, you know? And so what you have is this disjunct where at times American policymakers have said, well, we don't really care about the caliphate's absurd, it's nonsense, we're not gonna worry about that. Meanwhile, that's what motivates a lot of the jihadi violence. That's what their main principal political goal is. That's still Al Qaeda's goal. Um, they're now, I'm not saying that they're gonna actually build a real caliphate anytime soon, but you know, if they win in Afghanistan, they win in Somalia, they win some other places, then they start having the, the infrastructure of these emirates in place to at least claim success in that regard. Yep. Well, I know that we've been on for, for about our allotted time here. So let me leave an open-ended question for you, which is, uh, you know, you, when we've already touched on it, you've, you've mentioned some false narratives that have been built up, but you, in our exchange before this, you know, you were saying there are a lot of, of false narratives built up over the last 20 years. Are there any others that you would like to hit on? Well, I, I just, I think to recap, because obviously I talk a lot, so hopefully people are following along. I mean, that's uh, perfect for a podcast, so. I guess so, yeah. I guess so. Uh, but, you know, I, I mean, the first narrative is that um, Al-Qaeda was only interested in attacking the U.S. and the West. That was false. It's always been false. It's still false. And it was always false. Obviously, Bin Laden's gone, but they, they, they are interested in attacking the U.S. and the West, yes. But that's not their sole interest or their sole motivation, reason for existence at all. A second narrative has been that the Taliban and Al-Qaeda are not joined at the hip. They are. There's a wealth of evidence that they are. In, in fact, what's funny to watch is the official assessments now at the end of the U.S. presence in Afghanistan have come around to the minority report that we kept issuing at Long War Journal for all these years and are now saying, yeah, in fact, they are closely tied together. Yeah, I wish the U.S. had gotten that right a lot sooner because there was a lot, a lot of things could have been done differently, but didn't now, now that at the end. And I think... Another narrative is that um, the U.S. just needs to focus on great power competition when it comes to Russia and China and forget about all this. Um, I think that, yeah, I, as I said earlier, I think the bulk of our resources as Americans have already been shifted away from the post 9-11 conflicts. I think it makes sense to shift most of the resources away. Um, I think it makes sense to worry about China. I've written a lot about China recently myself because it's something that I was tracking for six years before I started writing about it. I think that is that is a different scale of threat to American American interests for sure. But it's not it's not the case that America can shift entirely away from the post 9-11 conflicts and wash its hands of all this and think it's going to be fine. Because I just don't think that's the case. You did mention earlier, kind of an offhand comment in passing. You, you said America is no longer a superpower. How, why do you feel that way? 
I, I don't think the U.S. is a superpower. I think my grand thesis in short of what's going on is I think you're witnessing a failure of the American elite. You, you know, a lot of different ways I could come at this, but in consistent with this podcast, I think what I witnessed in Afghanistan, for example, and this is why I don't, when people say, just get out, I don't want to deal with it. I don't, I don't dismiss that at all because believe me, I could probably articulate the problems that I've witnessed in Afghanistan and how the U.S. US has prosecuted this war probably just as well as anyone, if not better. There's been a lot of elite failures in Afghanistan from the Americans, uh, just the unwillingness to see the world as it is and get it right, unwillingness to tell the truth. And I think that that has um, manifested itself in a lot of other ways, too. I think you have an American elite now that are not really don't really want to defend America as a nation or its history. I think we are involved in this incessant game of navel gazing of all of its problems in the, from the past, just constant. And certainly there are many you know sins in America's history, of course, you know, but this it's just constant now. Uh, that's all you hear about. It seems to me. And if, if you look at the American lean on a, on a person by person basis, just just take a look around at the different people that have been exposed in recent years. Um, you know, I made a I made a joke recently on another podcast about Henry Kissinger, who in foreign po- the foreign policy establishment, which is something I deal with and I've dealt with quite extensively, that Henry Kissinger is sort of the Bernie Madoff of the foreign policy establishment. You know, Bernie Madoff was this elite in the finance world thought to be the world's super investor. And he was just running an elaborate Ponzi scheme. You know, Henry Kissinger was basically doing that only with China as his, his foil for the Americans, you know, basically profiting off of, you know, dealing with the Chinese and serving their interests more than the American interests for decades. And nobody's called him on it, you know, or very few people call him on it. That type of failure of the American elite, I think is very tough to come to grips with. But I think that if you start looking at the world that way, what's going on within America now. I think that uh, there's a lot more I could say about it, but that's basically where I'm looking at it. And I think when you lose your will to um, defend your own nation's history and your own nation, and you are incessantly involved in trying to undermine it, I think you're a spent force. We'll have to touch on Kissinger in the next time you you come on the airwaves. Uh, Cause I, I know you have a lot to say there and I, I tend to agree. Well, all I would say is if you, you better you better read up on Kissinger before we have that one because I can give you about nine hours of content of why I think he's a fraud. So, so you know, it's not it's not it's not pretty. Like I don't I don't I think he's an intellectual fraud, and I think what is in terms of how he articulates his version of policy is also fraudulent. So uh, I don't really have any positive to say about him. But the fact that so many people in the foreign policy world have been enamored with him for so long, again, I think is an example of elite failure. Is what I would say. That, that's fair. You you have a book uh, behind you that is uh, Ulysses S. Grant. It's a Chernow book, and uh, that's one of my favorites. And uh, I think that we are desperately in need of a, a Grant right now. I don't think that we've seen one for a long time. We're gonna we're gonna need new American leaders, and I don't know if they're out there. Um, and again, they could be they could be men, women. Of any you know, America has always been multicultural. It's multiracial. I'm not about any of that stuff. It could be coming from any different sector of our society, but we're going to need, we're going to need new leaders because the ones we've got now are, are not getting the job done. And the issue of Grant, of course, as you know, the history and as so many prior listeners know is that Lincoln was desperate for a general who would fight to win. Um, part of what happened in Afghanistan, by the way, is we didn't find a Grant like figure to lead the war effort uh, um, there. Um, that's part of the issue. But more broadly speaking, that sort of competition, that sort of trying to find somebody who's going to really fight to win is really lacking in our U.S. military cadres, I would say, at this point, at the top, the top tier. And I think, I think we have had a similar failure of the leadership in the political elite as well. Yeah, I think Lincoln, Lincoln has that famous quote about Grant where someone was, was talking about, oh, yeah, it was, it was, I can't spare this man. He fights. Right. Perfect. Yeah. Well, we need some fighters. Um, where where can uh, where can people find you? Well, I uh, tweet very sporadically at my own handle on Twitter. I have very distrustful social media, so that's why I do that. Um, but I also write a lot at the Dispatch for its new newish publication. Um, you know, basically formed by uh, people in exile during the Trump years, I would say. Uh, you know, and also I write a lot at FDD's Long War Journal. Uh, which is where I do a lot of my coverage. And we have a podcast there as well called Generation Jihad, which uh, if you're not sick of listening to me by now, you can tune in in there as well. 
All right. Well, I will link to those in the show notes and thanks for coming on, Tom. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed that podcast. Please leave a five-star written review on Apple Podcasts if you're listening there and give us a follow or subscribe on whatever you're listening to. And we will see you next week.